Welcome back. So we continue through Mark chapter 14. As I said last time, it's a very long chapter. I think it is the longest chapter in all of the Gospels. If not, then it's really close. Maybe Matthew chapter 26. I don't know. You can look that one up on your own time. But let's see. So where we left off, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said that his betrayer was at hand. Let's continue. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him, with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now, the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him, and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to, him, to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. All right, so here it is. This is the moment that Jesus has been predicting. He's been talking, uh, he's already said three times that the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders are going to, uh, going to take him, seize him, and ultimately kill him. And this is the moment where that happens. Judas betrays him. And there's this key word here that I think must have really stung. He goes up to Jesus and he says, Rabbi, which means teacher. He is betraying the person who has taught him all of the wonderful things that he should have learned and, and lived by. And, but when he comes up to him and betrays him, he calls him teacher. And I can only imagine Jesus is sitting there thinking, wow, you're calling me teacher, yet you're ignoring all of the things I taught you. That must have been really a bitter pill for Jesus to swallow at that point. And then we learn that, uh, as he predicted, the sheep were scattered. All of the apostles left him at this moment. He's arrested and everyone runs away. Yes, uh, Peter, as we learn in another gospel account, Peter does stick up for Jesus and he cuts off the, uh, the ear of the slave of the high priest. And uh, that just is another example of Peter not quite getting it. Peter doesn't understand that in the kingdom of heaven, this is not how we go to war. We go to war through prayer, we go th to war through uh, righteous deeds. But, but once again, Peter is thinking along the lines of a kingdom of man, an earthly style kingdom. And because of this, he's missed, missed it entirely. And so uh, he ends up running away like everybody else. But now let's look at the next little section because it's kind of obscure, it's kind of weird. Most people uh, who have, have read the Bible don't even know this part's in there. So let's have a look at it. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. Huh. Kind of random. Whenever you've uh, been taught about the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm pretty sure that this part never came up. So what's this all about? Why is it there? It's kind of odd, right? Well, I'm going to go to uh, a couple of places in other gospel accounts, and I think you'll work out wh where I'm going with this before we revisit this, these two verses. But let's have a look. So in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, he, Matthew is actually talking about his own calling by Jesus. He says that Jesus came to him and that he was, in, uh, that he was a tax collector, he was in a tax booth, and Jesus said to him, follow me. And Matthew, being an amazing rule follower, he does exactly as he's told. He gets up and he follows Jesus. So Matthew is presenting himself in his own gospel as someone who didn't need to be told twice, somebody who got the message the first time, and followed Jesus straight away. Okay. Luke, well, in his gospel, he hardly talks about himself at all. He mentions, uh, he talks about himself in the first person for the first couple of verses, just like he does in the book of Acts. He's writing to somebody called Theophilus. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And he's writing to this person, telling him all the stories of Jesus's life that Luke thought were important. And then later on in the sequel, he talks about the Acts of the Apostles. But he doesn't really talk about himself very much. St. Paul, on the other hand, mentions him three times in his letter to the Colossians, to Philemon, and to Timothy. And it's in the letter to the Colossians we hear of Luke being known as the Blessed Physician. And so that's why we refer to Luke as a doctor, because St. Paul told us about this. So John, in his gospel, he refers to himself as the beloved disciple, according to some translations. In this example I have here, it, it just says the other disciple. But, uh, and in other translations, you'll find it will say the disciple Jesus loved. Well, obviously, Jesus loved all of his disciples, but John likes to make, make a big deal of the fact that he was particularly well-liked. Remember, this is the same John who had asked if in the future, in heaven, he gets to sit at the right and or the left of Jesus. So John really likes to feel important. Well, 
they, it, it's after the, the uh, resurrection. Jesus has been crucified, he's been buried, and John and Peter run to the tomb. And John mentions himself as beating Peter in the race, which I think is really funny. And then later on in verse 8, he has to mention it one more time. Oh, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, he saw and believed. He had to mention that he got there first. He was faster than St. Peter. That was really important to John to stick that in there. But I also think it's important, uh, while I'm giving John a hard time for kind of boasting, I also think it's important that while he did get to the tomb first, he still uh, you know, gave Peter the respect because he waited until Peter arrived and for Peter to go in first. Because uh, perhaps ranking, understanding that while he could outrun Peter, he, couldn't, he doesn't outrank him. And as the first pope, as the rock on which the church is built, John uh, shows deference and allows Peter to be the one who does the exploration first. So, who is this young man who runs off naked? Well, most scholars believe it was Mark himself. And so I love the idea that Mark is putting himself in, in his gospel with a little bit of humility and kind of an embarrassing story. And it's kind of like that cartoon thing where someone grabs a coat and then the character slips out of it and runs off. And in this case, Mark's running off absolutely naked, which I think is really funny. I wonder where he ended up. Anyway, that's the end of uh, this little section. It's nice to have a little bit of light st stuff here in Matthew, four sorry, in Mark 14, because this uh, little section is not particularly light at all. So thank you, Mark, for putting that in there to give us something to smile about in an otherwise dark section of the story. Okay, thank you ever so much. Bye-bye now.